Your opportunity to ask a question to our panel, the number to call 0345 6060 973. A very eclectic range of questions coming in so far, which I rather like. But the evenings I don't like are where they're all on the same subject. Joining me on the panel, Barry Gardner, Labour MP for Brent North, who had various roles in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. Uh, Lord Moylan, Daniel Moylan, Conservative peer, former advisor to Boris Johnson when he was Mayor of London. Olivia Utley is Assistant Comment Editor at The Telegraph. And Polly Toynbee is Guardian columnist and author so they're here to answer your calls 0345 6060 973 and if you've never watched us before why don't you break the habit of a lifetime and go on to global player and you can do just that call 0345 6060 973 tweet at lbc text 84850 cross question with ian dale this is lbc Well, welcome to you all. Let's go straight to our first caller. It's Milan in Ashford. Milan, hi, what would you like to ask? Good evening. Um, I'd like to ask, why is the government uh, reluctant or even terrified of having an honest analysis of the impact of Brexit? Scrutiny isn't something uh, to be afraid of. It's actually really healthy, but I'm struggling to keep up with the volume of lies and nonsense in the last 12 months. <laughs> Well, isn't it Parliament's job to scrutinise it? And we've had the Public Accounts Committee issue their report today on the impact of Brexit on business. Uh, the government issued a, a paper, I think it was at the end of the year, to mark the first anniversary of Brexit, where they were pointing out what they thought were all the benefits. Um, let's go to you, Daniel Moylan. I don't know whether you're a Brexiteer or Remainer. No, oh, I'm a staunch Brexiteer. <clears throat> I, I think one of the problems of assessing the benefits of Brexit is that not all of them can be reduced to monetary values. I mean, what price do you put on having your own independent democracy? What price do you put on being able to make your own laws and have your own say and elect the government that makes the laws for you? You can't put a price on those things. So uh, I just don't think this sort of exercise can be carried out unless you say... Brexit is only about trade. It was never only about trade. When do you think that it'll be possible to make that impact assessment? I mean, I completely get that 12 months on, it's not really very valuable to do that sort of thing, particularly when we've had the pandemic over the last year. What, what If there are problems, are they down to the pandemic or are they down to Brexit? How do you determine that? Do you think that maybe after five years, the government ought to commission an independent study on the on, on how it's turned out? I, I think the difficulty is that even if you did just look at trade, you'd be dealing with a, a counterfactual. You'd be saying, how has trade developed over the last five years since Brexit compared to what it would have behaved like in, in other circumstances? And that just gets you back to the same sort of modelling and arguments about assumptions which have bedeviled much of the COVID forecasting when we've seen that sort of modelling, you know, has become, come to the fore. Um, and if you did end up with the figures we've seen in the past, you end up with figures like sort of, you know, it's a quarter percent on GDP over 20 years, which is a sort of meaningless number because nobody knows what's going to happen in the next 20 years anyway. So I don't think it ever comes to a point. You just get on with life, for God's sake, you know. Is that what we do, not constantly navel-gazing? Omphiloscopy is a great word, Ian. I've is discovered it? it. Yeah, I've no idea what that means. It means navel-gazing. It is the official omphiloscopy. Okay. On philosophy, we must so put behind us on this and look to the future. What are you talking about? Yes, I'm sure he wants to move on because <laughs> it's quite embarrassing what we already know. The government's own OBR, official of budget, uh, Office of Budget Responsibility, has said 4% less of GDP. And that's Remind us when they've got any prediction right. Well, it's what all the budget is based on. I mean, when the yeah, Chancellor says, oh, look, I've suddenly got 13 billion more because it's 13 billion different to the bas to the forecast, that's what he then spends. So it's it's what the Chancellor works on, for better or worse. It's 4% uh, over 20 years, isn't it? I mean, you know, the budget is one year ahead. You can probably get that right. 20 years? Well, I think uh, what we're seeing at the moment, uh, when you listen to, I talk to a lot of business people, absolutely desperate, desperate about things like having to create a new kite mark. So everything has to be both European and and UK kite mark, although the two are pretty much the same. And now you have Jacob Rees-Mogg put into a position where he's been instructed, it's reported, going in there, that he must have a bonfire of a thousand regulations. Well, what are those regulations going to be? And if you really do, 
then we won't be able to trade with anybody because we won't be aligned with anybody else, certainly not with Europe. Is it going to be a bonfire of employment or environmental or agricultural? What kind of regulations are we medical? Are we going to lose? And uh, is that a good idea? I think it'll be pretty unpopular. Are, are, are you truly saying that there are no regulations that we could get rid of, and that the only good, re- the, the the only thing to do is to ever increase the regulatory load? No, we've had uh, so many bonfires of red tape. Labour tried it, Tories before them, Tories after them. There have always been somebody put in charge of bonfire of red tape, and quite a lot do go, but there is a limit. Most of them are there for a good reason, for health and safety, and they love Well, then they won't go, will they? Well, I think they probably won't. So it's, again, it's a bit of a myth-maker, like most of the Brexit benefits are non-existent. Okay. Worse than non-existent. Olivia. Well, I agree with Lord Moylan that that it's it can't just be measured in monetary benefit. And it is about the principle of the thing. And, and that's what we talked about <laughs> repeatedly over quite a lot of years. And also, I think the point that, that would be sort of making kind of counterfactual argument if we try to kind of assess it, it it's completely true. The EU has changed a lot since we left it. Um, we've seen the EU make a, a lot of mistakes. I think it's quite easy in Britain to, to sort of watch our government, um, you know, make a lot of mistakes and, and say, oh, Britain's so embarrassing. But but you know, look at what France has done. Look at what Germany's done. Look at look at how pathetic Germany's being on on the Ukraine situation. Look at the way Macron talked down the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is still having effects. We've got an article coming out in the Telegraph tomorrow about the effects it's having on on uh, vaccine hesitancy in Africa. Um, that once he said that what he said about AstraZeneca, he couldn't take it back, and it and it you know caused vaccine hesitancy everywhere. So the EU hasn't covered itself in glory over the last couple of years at all, and the EU's moved in a different direction. Britain's relationship with the EU was already strained. So what, what are we comparing Brexit, you know, Brexit Britain to? What, Britain in a perfect EU? Britain in a perfect EU with a perfect relationship with the EU? No. Where would we be if we hadn't left the EU? I think it's very difficult to quantify that. And unless we can do that, I don't think a sort of big Brexit assessment would work. But I would say we're already, we've already seen a few benefits. I mean, I think that that you know, okay, we could have had our own vaccine programme while in the EU, but let's not pretend it would have been easy. Our vaccine programme was fantastic. We're we're getting out of COVID restrictions quicker than almost any other European country. Um, I think some of that does have something to do with with getting our sovereignty back and and being in charge of our own decisions. Barry Gardner, I've always thought of you as a bit of a Brexity Remainer, if such a a thing can exist. Um, Do you think, going back to Milan's question, why is the government reluctant to have an honest analysis of the impact of Brexit? We have only been out for a year. Is it too early to do that? Look, I I wanted to stay in the European Union, but I'm a Democrat. Uh, The public spoke. They were given the opportunity. And I feel that what we have to now do is to get on with it. Um, Now, what I would take issue with is the way in which the government is failing to get on with it properly. And we have it's not just the Public Accounts Committee that have been looking at this. On the Environment and Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee, we've had uh, farmers and, and the meat industry before us just this week. And what they've been saying is, look, they're making a hash of these trade deals with Australia because they've failed to come to us. They've failed to get the necessary information that we could have helped them with ahead of time. And had there been pro- proper consultation with industry, we could have avoided some of the pitfalls that now mean that all the animal uh, rights, uh, all the um, animal welfare issues that we care about in this country are not going to be applied. All the the sanitary and phytosanitary regulations that we apply um, in not having hormones in beef and things like that. Um, These are the things that they've failed to actually get into the trade deal. And and actually, I believe trade should be a really important way, not just of us getting cheaper goods in this country, but I think it also should be a way of us making sure that the sort of values and qualities of product that we want to see are enlarged around the world. Trade should be about elevating justice, elevating human rights. It should also be about um, making sure that the the things that we value in terms of 
But, but trade, animal, trade agreements animal are given, welfare trade agreements are give and take. We, we can't go to another country, it doesn't matter whether it's a large country or not, and say, well, you have to accept all of our demands or we're not going to do a trade no, of course deal not. with you. No, absolutely not. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Of course, you go in there, but you go in there with a mandate. And one of the failures that the government has had is it's, it's refused to have a mandate. It's refused to do consultation and mandate. And you ask the Americans, you ask the Australians, what they do is they have a mandate for their trade negotiations and they find it really helpful because when Britain or anybody else asks for something in a negotiation, they say, sorry, we can't do that because it's not in our mandate and the mandate's been approved by Congress. Now, if we had a mandate that said, I'm sorry, we can't do that, we can't let you undermine our industry in that way because the mandate from Parliament well, the mandate is The mandate is from government and the government has a majority of 80, so whatever Parliament decided, it would be decided by the government. I don't see what the difficulty is. Uh, because there's clarity in the mandate that's been backed by the parliament and as you've as you know, during the Brexit <laughs> negotiations, uh, yes, the government may have had a majority, but it often didn't get its own way because people on its own well, side didn't well, agree Well, it, did, it did after the election. In the end. Daniel, do you yeah. just want to respond to what Barry's said there? Yeah, I, I'm a bit of a heretic on this. I mean, I'm not against us doing trade deals, but I um, think they're grossly overrated. Um, very few trade deals, when you measure their outcomes, have any significant or measurable effect on GDP growth in either of the two parties. And Barry has illustrated something else about them, which I find very objectionable, is that very little of negotiation in trade deals is actually about trade. A great deal of it is about the exercise of power by one, the, 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 no, the, more, no, the that, stronger that, that one That simply the other, is not true. Imposing, imposing standards and requirements on another economy that may or may not be appropriate for them, which is not a trade issue at all. Now, Barry and I disagree there. He thinks they should be about elevating standards, spreading values, doing that sort of stuff. I don't because it's asymmetrical and basically neo-colonial. So <laughs> I, can do, I can do absolutely fine without trade deals if we don't have them. As far as the farmers are concerned, I think the farmers in this country are tremendous and the farming industry is absolutely marvellous but they, they do have a knee-jerk reaction to say that they don't want to have uh, any change um, and what they are happy with... So they voted the past, for Brexit, Daniel. They did, Farmers they overwhelmingly did, the national, voted for Brexit, they did, but they're but the saying national, the way in which the this government is conducted The National Farmers Union, the National Farmers wrong. Union have opposed any measures that would allow additional food to come into the country. I understand that from their point of view. Yes. But I think you can't just consult farmers. You have to think about consumers and you have to think well, about why don't we talk other about participants fishermen, in the in economy case. as well. The, the fishermen, fishermen again, been, voted for Brexit the on a promise been, that people like you gave them that said that actually we would be taking back all our fish. If you look at the way in which fishermen are furious now, the way in which this government has failed to negotiate properly on their behalf, the way in which their industry is being undermined, the mental health pressures on fishermen that read the fishing Barry, daily I'm, last I'm, week. I'm with you. I'm with you on Well, you're not. I am, because, because, because I'm, you say we're talking it's about wonderful. The, the fishermen no, no, say I'm it's talking not. About, there are two aspects. So thanks to the parliament you sat in, up until Christmas or de December 2019, the parliament you sat in, the government was totally hobbled and ended up with a poor deal in two aspects in particular. The treatment of Northern Ireland, which is now the only part of Europe where, pe where people are subject to laws made by a foreign power without their consent, and the treatment of our fishing waters. Daniel, and those two do, do things you remember have who to be was? rescued do and you rolled back. It yes, it was Boris... Sorry, can, can, can I no. just... Sorry. You know, no. I don't want to talk Very quickly, because I need to go can, to break. You remember that it was Boris Johnson who went to Northern Ireland, who spoke to the politicians in Northern Ireland and precisely promised him what you know is not the case. They, he precisely promised that there would be no border down the Irish Sea, that there would be no checks... Now, and he's been badly let down by the no, European no, not Union's badly let interpretation down. His of that promise text. But was my, wrong. Point, 
My point is, to look to the future, those two things need to be sorted out. As far as the right. fisheries are concerned, I'm with you. You need to add Northern Ireland to the bill. It's a, a wholly undemocratic says, uh, position. Why do we dump sewers in our river? I think it means sewage in our river after leaving the EU. Well, let me break it to you. We were dumping sewage in the river while we were in the EU as well. And that's something hopefully we might be able to rectify. Uh, right, more questions to come. Pin your ears back because the next question is on Israel. It's 18 minutes past eight. LBC. I'm just Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 21 minutes past eight on LBC. With us in the studio, Barry Gardner, Olivia Utley, Polly Toynbee and Daniel Moylan, Lord Moylan. Right, let's go to our next question. It's Yasmin in Glasgow. Hello, Yasmin. Hello. So is the UK government taking the Amnesty International report declaring Israel an apartheid state seriously? Bearing in mind that this conclusion has arisen from four years of work by leading professionals in international law. And secondly, Ian, if you could weigh in on this as well, why do you think that the conclusions of this report have not been featured in mainstream media in any meaningful way, if at all? Well, we're doing that right now, Yasmin, by the fact that we're having your question. Um, let me put this into a bit of context. Um, Amnesty International has joined other human rights groups in stating that Israel's system, quote, system of oppression and domination over the Palestinians amounts to the international definition of apartheid. Uh, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Yair Lapid, rejected the report, saying it was divorced from reality, saying Amnesty, quotes, lies spread by terrorist organisations, and he then accused Amnesty of anti-Semitism. Um, Olivia Artley, it is true this hasn't had a lot of publicity in, in the UK media. How, how do you respond to Yasmin? I mean, I couldn't, I, I sort of agreed with uh, with what the with, with what the Israeli commentator said about it there. I mean, I'm not a huge expert on this. He's a foreign minister. Foreign me. minister, sorry. Um, it's, yeah, not enough coverage over here. Um, but, but it seems there, there are a lot of 
much worse regimes out there, as we know. And <coughs> there does seem to be this just obsession with what Israel's doing wrong. And of course, the Israeli government could definitely be doing things better. And there, there are gross inequalities uh, in Israel and Palestine. Um, but but there are gross inequalities, I mean, here and across across huge swathes of the rest of the world as well. And it does seem to be a bit of an obsession with, with Israel, which, you know, if, if not um, anti-Semitic, it's sort of... Israelophobic uh, uh, to any extent, and it it just I'm not quite sure. I, I think it's quite healthy that we haven't gone on too much about it over here because we criticise Israel an awful lot, and 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 it, rightly so in lots of cases. But but I think it's wrong to to, to just sort of obsess to, to the detriment of you know talking about any other gross inequalities across the rest of the world. Harry Gardner. Look, I I think one of the important things about the IHRA definition uh, of anti-Semitism is that it states very clearly that legitimate criticism of the politics of Israel is not to be regarded as anti-Semitism. And yeah. therefore, I, I think what Olivia said about not confusing those two is absolutely right. But it's calling it an apartheid state legitimate criticism. Uh, well, I haven't read the report, and, and that's probably because it hasn't been well trailed in the media in this country. Um, I will read the report because Amnesty is a, a highly respected international organisation. And uh, I, as I say, I don't know, but you, you said they'd spent four years, or I think she said, they'd spent, Yasmin said they'd spent four years doing some detailed research. So I think at the very least, we should read that um, and we should understand why they have made those made those statements. Okay. Daniel? Um, when I left university, my first job actually involved going to work in the British Embassy in South Africa for a few years. So I sort of, in the, in the apartheid years, so, so I've sort of lived apartheid. I've always treated the term and the phenomenon of apartheid as being specifically a South African thing and a historical thing. And I think any idea of a, an international definition I find slightly confusing. Israel's problem is that it is ambivalent about the fact that it has two classes of person whom it governs in the same territory, one with votes and the full rights of citizens, and the other without. And its legal position in this is also ambivalent because it, it both declares it's not a, a militarily occupying force, which most of the world thinks it is, but at the same time it won't acknowledge that uh, the occupied territories, if you call them that, are part of Israel. So they're in a position where they're, um, they're not giving rights to people they govern, but they're equally not saying they're foreigners who are going to be independent when we end the end military occupation. And in the meantime, they're doing things that a military occupation wouldn't allow legally under international law. So all of this can be resolved through dialogue eventually, but there has to be, and it needs to be resolved, because Israel's position is always going to be challenged and under questioned until it is. But it needs dialogue and the agreement of both sides. And they both need to come to the table. At the moment, there isn't enough sign of that. Holly? I agree with a lot of what you've just said. I think labelling something apartheid isn't terribly helpful because, as you say, that's a, a different time, a different regime, a different nature, and to simply brand it. But I think, you know, a, a close analytical uh, discussion of everything that's going wrong with what Israel's doing is absolutely right and fair. Amnesty should be respected. It's a bit of whataboutery to say, well, there are worse regimes. Well, amnesty does the worst regimes as well. It does do China. It does do Saudi Arabia. It, do, it does everywhere where, uh, you know, breaking of human rights carries on. I'm glad to say that you're reading and reading this report. You're actually reading it out of The Guardian. The Guardian mm. has covered this The report. Guardian is the oracle. The Guardian is the oracle, <laughs> has covered it. Um, you know, in the end, most sensible observers look at the situation and have said for years, two-state solution yep. is the only answer. And it is very depressing that Israel's previous government and this government uh, have rejected it, are rejecting it at the moment, despite what America thinks, despite what a great many of countries that regard themselves as essentially uh, allies of Israel, the state of Israel, say, and it's getting nowhere. But in the end, that is going to be the only solution. Mm. And, uh, you know, it feels a long way off. I think it's important when talking about Israel to remember, like when people talk about Britain, it's not all 
authorities Britain. The Israel is not all this government or Netanyahu's yeah. government before it. Uh, you know, there are an awful lot of people in Israel who want a two-state solution and an awful lot of people who fight very hard for human rights within Israel as well. Um, just, just, uh, sorry, just to say quickly, cool. I wasn't saying that Amnesty shouldn't have written the report and that it doesn't. I was saying the question Yasmin asked was why hasn't it been covered in the British press? And, and I think the point I was making was that there are plenty of issues like this to be covered and, and perhaps the fact that we're not talking about it all the time is just because there are there are other issues too. I, I think there is a point here, isn't there, that, that foreign news in this country I think is covered generally quite lamentably, not just by the print press, but by the broadcast media too. And we concentrate on America so much. Now, for understandable reasons in many ways, if you're on the broadcast media, you can always get sound and pictures from America, which you can't necessarily easily from Bangladesh or somewhere like that. Um, but... I, I wonder what can be done also to interest British people in foreign affairs. I mean, if we if there's some big international crisis like Ukraine, most people haven't got wouldn't even be able to point out Ukraine on a map. And I know on this program we really try and um, highlight these issues, but you sometimes wonder if a lot of the media don't because they just think, well, nobody's interested. So, I don't. So why I don't would we do I it? Think, I actually, think if we had covered Europe properly over the years, if we'd really understood Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and their differing views, we would have seen Europe differently. It was covered so badly. It was covered as a monolith, a building with lots of flags on it, a Brussels bureaucracy, and we never covered the lives, the aspirations, the politics of the different countries in Europe. So we never really identified with them. We stood aside. I think we've been very isolationist. Yes, I'm afraid, in our media coverage of most abroad, even our closest neighbours. I actually slightly agree with Polly, but I think we've had more you coverage. Agreeing quite a lot tonight. We've had more <laughs> coverage of European countries since Brexit than we had when we were members of the European Union. But I think you're wrong to say that, or journalists are wrong to say that there's no interest. I think there's, I detect amongst people who are vaguely aware, there's huge interest in what's happening in the crisis in Afghanistan in the moment, um, which nobody is reporting on. I mean, you know, there's widespread starvation and suffering. We're not seeing television broadcast coverage of what's no, happening. No, because very few television crews in Afghanistan yeah, but it, for obvious reasons. That, well, that's I'm, why. Yeah, I, I understand that, but it only takes one pool but, you know, the, the, for this to be broadcast. The question is, your question, perfectly fair question is, are British people interested in what happens abroad? I think they are, and I don't think we should be dependent entirely on the fact that there's easy technology, as Polly says. You, you said, sorry, you get stuff from America. We can see wildfires mm. in Australia very easily because they've got the technology. We see the pictures. People are interested in them. And I think broadcasters should make a bigger effort to try and cover those places. Well, I'll give you, you one example. Effort. About a year ago, we did an hour-long phone-in on the Indian farmers who were being persecuted, essentially. I knew nothing about this, I have to say. And I, I started it by saying what I knew and then saying, right, we've got a lot of British Indians listen to this programme. You tell us all about it. And I got so many responses after that hour from people who weren't from an Indian heritage saying, well, I never knew any of that. How yeah. interesting was yeah. that? Yeah. Sometimes broadcasters have to take risks and challenge their audiences rather than just talk about immigration and benefits and all, the, all of the usual things that we talk about. Anyway, end of homily. Thank you very much for your contributions so far. We'll take more of your questions in just a moment. It's 8.31. Lottie Morley has the news headlines. More than 50 people connected to lockdown events at Number 10 will be contacted by police. The Metropolitan Police have been handed a new photo of the Prime Minister from December 2020, appearing to show him with two colleagues dressed in tinsel and an open bottle of champagne. Remaining COVID restrictions in England, including the legal requirement to self-isolate, could end later this month. The Prime Minister told MPs he expects the rules will finish a month earlier than planned, as long as positive trends in the data continues. The current restrictions are due to expire on March 24th. There's been a major breakthrough in the quest for clean zero carbon energy. A group of scientists at a lab in Oxfordshire have generated the largest amount of energy from nuclear fusion. It boosts hope that a clean source of power could soon be harnessed commercially. LBC weather, occasional rain in the south tonight, cold further north with wintry showers and gales, a low of zero degrees. LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. With me, Barry Gardner, Labour MP for Brent North, Lord Moylan, Conservative peer, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Olivia Utley, assistant comment editor at The Telegraph, and Polly Toynbee, Guardian columnist and author. Have you got a new book you want to plug, Polly? I've got my book, The Lost Decade, 2010 to 2020, which explains why we're You've in been the hole we're in. For ages. It's a, come on, get your productivity up. We need, <laughs> we need a new one. Right, let's go to another caller. It's our old friend Sean in concert. Sean, hello. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Hello, panel. Uh, can you tell me, is it, uh, I love me animals, right? And I, and I think it's a disgrace what he's done. Do you think £250,000 is a bit over the top? For a fame. So, so this is Kurt Zuma, the West Ham footballer who was filmed kicking a cat, among other things. Um, he's been fined by West Ham two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, which is two weeks' wages. That's the maximum allowed under the agreement between the Premier League and the Professional Footballers Association. Is that enough? Yesterday, we took calls from people saying he should be sacked by West Ham. Um, he played the match last night. Um, Barry Gardner, I, I don't know if you're a football fan, but I imagine you're probably an animal lover. Yeah. Sean, look, £250,000, I think, to anybody normally would be a lot of money. Unfortunately, to some of these footballers, it's not. Uh, and therefore, you know, if he thinks he's losing two weeks' wages, well, what does that mean he's getting for the rest of the year? 50 times... Quite know, a few million pounds. Quite a few million yes. pounds, isn't it? Uh, so I don't think it's going to make a, a real impact. I think probably what makes more of an impact is the fact that fans of West Ham will actually look at him differently and think, what a creep. Um, you know, how can you actually feel yourself better by inflicting pain on, on, on another being in that way? Um what he's done is horrible. He should feel ashamed of it. And I suspect the sort of public humiliation of it is going to be the biggest thing that he feels. 250,000 quid for him doesn't mean a great deal. Polly Joinby. Yep, I think shaming is probably the best you can do with people who are making that many I would have been, millions. had I been at the London Stadium last night, I would have been booing him. And yeah. I've been a season ticket holder for 30 years and I've never booed one of my own players. Mm. Right. I'm not a football person myself. <laughs> you should come with me one day. Thank you. I'll take that as an invitation. <laughs> I think that um, I think all footballers do like to be liked. I think um, being popular with their fans is important. And, uh, you know, his reputation will have taken a kicking. Oh, very good. Daniel? Well, don't kick cats. I mean, it's just disgusting. Uh, behavior. I can't say whether two hundred and fifty thousand um, pounds is a um, a sufficient penalty. That's under his contract of employment. Um, I don't see why there should be a deal with the Professional Footballers Association in the first place to to limit it. I mean, these a penalty like that should be proportionate to the offence. How can you say two weeks is the maximum uh, that you can actually impose on somebody? But that's the deal they've got. Um, do we know if the police are taking an interest? Well, Essex Police said yesterday that they were taking an interest, but um, I'm not sure that they've made any progress today. I mean, you'd have thought, if they've got the video, what more do they need? You've got, you've got a cast-iron conviction there, you'd have thought. And there was a time when police actually chased convictions. Mm. Well, I'm not one for... I mean, it's an operational decision for Essex Police. I'm probably the last politician left in the country who believes in our established constitutional convention that politicians don't tell police forces what operational decisions to take. So it's very much a matter up to them, but I was interested to know. I mean, this is not a person I'd actually want to meet particularly or go out with, and maybe... Um, maybe his football career will come to an end quite soon. I, I would love to know, and I'm sure we will get to know, what his fellow teammates mm. have thought, think of it. Because if I was one of them, I would find it quite difficult to interact with him after this. Olivia? Yeah, I completely agree. I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to agree with everyone else. I don't think many people are feeling sorry for Zuma's bank balance when you see that video of that poor cat. My cat's listening at home as well, so I'd be too scared to say anything What's else. What's your cat called? B. 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 I'm very unimaginable. There's got another one called C. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think we can move on. Sean, thank you very much for that. Jake is in Battersea. Hello, Jake. Hi, Ian. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. What would you like to say? Good, good. I'm terribly sorry about the the old cat and um, 
uh, being kicked. And, and it's a terrible thing. You know, it, it, it doesn't make you want to rethink your allegiance with West Ham. No, it doesn't, because uh, if you're a football supporter, Why? you're part of a tribe, and just because of the stupid things that one player does, you don't throw out a lifetime support for a football club. I, I can guess you're not a football supporter, Jake, but what, what is your question? Uh, no, I, I'm simply... Um, I think that the, the standard of political debate has become so bad um, that we, I, we really need to have a rethink about it. Um, and I'm, uh, well, I, I, I think that there are so many cases that, that need to be examined uh, that, that we're all on hiding to nothing. But what's your question? What would you do about it if if you were to, to disagree with a, a person? Would you throw them off the end of Brighton Pier? Well, I think we can all agree the answer to that is hopefully no. But I guess what you're really saying is sort of... I, mean, I think the, the, the Keir Starmer uh, con contretemps earlier this week, I think that's probably provoked the question. Um, and I think what Jake really was meaning to ask is any aggression against a political opponent acceptable and that i mean it does relate to what he said about the standard of debate he, he didn't add sort of this program accepting there but i assume he thinks that we're having a good political debate um polly let's start with you um do, in your years of covering political debate do you think that it has deteriorated or has there always been a degree of aggression in it I don't think it's really debate when you have a mob depend descending on a politician. It was disgusting and frightening and, you know, American tinged and after what we saw happening at the Capitol, it's very scary. We've had two MPs murdered uh, quite recently. I think it's very frightening indeed and I think the fact that you can have a Prime Minister who threw that insult deliberately into the House of Commons, stirring up what was already a mad conspiracist right-wing trope uh, about Keir Starmer and uh, protecting Jimmy Savile was so disgusting. And then you might say, well, it was the heat of the moment, refusing to apologise time and time again. And, you know, the opinion polls showing in the last couple of days, vast numbers, 70% of people think he should apologise, and so does the majority of people who voted Tory. I think it's a mistake not to say you're sorry when you do something that has such a terrible effect. And it's important it doesn't keep happening. Of course, Piers Corbyn, who was, um, I don't know whether he was leading this mob, um, he says it was nothing to do with what Boris Johnson says. Well, very odd, wasn't it? Boris Johnson should say that for the first time. We have a mob out there talking about Jimmy Savile. I mean, it's curious the coincidence. The same mob has been making the same claims and they've been beating up other people, including following the threatening Nick Watt um, and, um, and other Conservatives. I mean, mostly about vax and well. COVID. And that's and what they're that's mostly, what mostly, mostly about. This talking was a new about. element. This was this not was... a new element in it. They've been it going. Was. This is part of a trope they've picked up, as you rightly say, from America. It is just ridiculous to attribute to it, and it's preposterous to try and claim that this has any comparison at all with the capital. This do, you really think that, do you really think that Boris Johnson Absolutely. was right to say that? Well, Would, I want to Are know, you supporting what, him for saying that? What did Keir Starmer apologise for? in 2013 follow, following the Alison Oh, Leggett I see. Review. So you are supporting... What did, you're he, saying what did he apologise for after a, an independent review which identified that there were three opportunities to bring a prosecution if the police and prosecutors... But said he was in no way to blame. Approach. And it is in no... It didn't say that, actually. This but I'm not outrageous. blaming him. I'm not blaming Keir Starmer. You're going too far. I'm not blaming Keir Starmer... He was he he, he commissioned that report and he apologized for the conduct of his department when he was in charge of it. And that's the right Okay, and so you're defending Boris thing Johnson to do. I'll tell you but what happened. Is, inside Downing this is, Street. This actually happened. Are you saying this didn't happen? I'm Polly? saying inside Downing Street. Are you saying it happened? Inside Downing Street, they are they discussed whether or not he should use this particular spear. And they decided his advisor said, No, we won't do that. And in the heat then of the moment. Then he went ahead and it, uh, in the heat Well, of in the moment. heat of the moment, uh, he went ahead and did it. And as a result, his, his advisor saying, of fourteen what years. Was Keir, 
apologising. His advisor for, of 40 if years walked went out wrong. because of what he did and because they decided well, if, not to because but, it was filthy. But are we, are we not allowed to discuss the Alison Levitt report? Are we not allowed to discuss what happened? Um, in the DPP's well, I think department, the, point is the Crown Prosecution we, we are, Service we are during allowed, that period. We are allowed to discuss because that. Because it, it appears we're not allowed to, no, to we, we are even allowed mention to it. But the point was, as Polly says, he ignored his advisor's well, he, yeah. advice and he, he made this comment at a totally inappropriate moment. I think you can say that that was not a, an appropriate place to do that. I don't see it. No, I'm not going to no. say that. I mean, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm happy to accept worked, you. You've worked with Manura Mirza yourself for, for many years when doing Boris Johnson's term as Mayor of London. She didn't resign over nothing, did she? I'm very sad to see Manura go, and she felt strongly about that. But actually, what we seem to be saying is... We can't discuss what actually happened or be rational about it. What did she feel and strongly about? Why did she, she go? She felt strongly about that. According to her letter, which you've yes. read, and I don't know any more than that, she felt strongly about the making of that remark. That's in her letter. Um, that's all I know about it. And, and she's worked with this man for 14 years. She knows him very well. And she right. thinks want, even this I was over the top. The beyond yeah, yeah, everything else. What you're Boris saying is way beyond that. You're trying to say this is like storming the capital. This is a whole bunch of Americans all stirred up by Boris. It's pure. Where's Corbyn attacking Keir Starmer? How's that got anything to do right. with Boris? Let, let's move on to our other two panel members. Olivia Utley. I mean, I agree that there are a bunch of nutters looking for someone to attack and they'll be in for Boris Johnson tomorrow. They're just sort of trying to emulate, you know, other nutters in other countries. They don't really have a particular goal. Um, I think it was a bit of a clumsy remark for Boris Johnson to say, and I think it was probably a bit unwise. But it is true that, that Keir Starmer did apologise for it. And I think Boris Johnson was clumsily trying to make the point that, you know, the buck stops with whoever's in charge of the organisation. Um, and it probably wasn't the right time to make it. But I also don't think that he was sort of playing in some right right, right wing trope okay. like inciting violence on Keir Starmer. That is ridiculous. They're All not right. who want to attack anyone. This is the, the party of Winston Churchill parroting the lies of Tommy Robinson and the smears. Um... I think it was an inexcusable remark. It was more inexcusable not to retract it. But I think the question that your caller was focused upon was what is the quality of debate? And, you know, Daniel says, well, are we not allowed to talk about that report? Of course we are. Of course we're allowed to talk about it. Of course we're allowed to discuss the merits, the pros and the cons of it. What we shouldn't do is be loose in our language. What we shouldn't do is use something as a smear to try and, and turn the public or other people against politicians who are trying to do an honest job. And I, I think it was a huge mistake that that was done. Um, and I hope that our discourse in Parliament can be better than but that. But people from all parties do this, don't they? I mean, I interviewed David Lammy immediately after this and people said, why didn't you ask him about his comments about Brexiteers calling them worse than Nazis? I mean, if you indulge in that kind of extreme language on either side of the political debate, people are going to kick back against it, aren't they? You, Ian, you know that in in all the disagreements that I have with, with many politicians across the House, I don't think I've ever tried to be discourteous or or abusive uh, or to diminish the person in any way. I don't think that's how we should debate and I think that's the point that your caller is making. We actually uh, need uh, to treat each other with respect when precisely yeah, which you, you always when have. we Absolutely. precisely when we disagree with each other. Okay. Um a, a question for you to consider while we go to a break. Mike says, let's see if you can guess which of your panel's son is a professional footballer. Clue, previous clubs include CS K, Moscow and Zenit St Petersburg. I think we can rule out Olivia on that one um, but uh, we'll, we'll find out that question in just a couple of minutes time. It's 8.49 This is LBC
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's 8.52. Um, Mike said, let's see if you can guess which one of your panel's sons is a professional footballer. Clue. Previous clubs include CSKA Moscow and Zenit St. Petersburg. Polly, is it you? My son would be staggered to think so. <laughs> no. <laughs> Daniel, is it you? No, I don't have any children. Must be you, Barry. It is. And I'm very proud of my son. Um, he's actually had a, a really serious injury. He's been out of the game for 18 months and he's just back. He's had to go down to lower leagues, but he's working his way back and he's what playing. What position really well. does he play? He's centre mid. Oh, so see, if he was centre back, I could have made an introduction to David Sullivan for you. Oh, well, he, he's, he's been known to play right back, so, you know, just uh, keep, keep it on the boil okay, there. Okay, right. Let's go to James in Hitchin. Hello, James. Uh, good evening. Uh, evening. With, with Valentine's Day approaching, does the panel think that new, techno new technologies like smartphones, iPhones, and so on have had a positive or negative impact on romantic relationships? Wow, I got an email today from a company saying, would we like to have their representative on on Valentine's Day? They've created an app. I can't remember what it was called. Something like Finding True Love, um, which would be very different from, shall we say, some of the other dating apps that uh, people use now. Olivia, I'm going to come to you because you're. I know you've only just got married, so you're not on all the apps. Well, I should hope you're not on all the apps <laughs> at, at the moment. But, I mean, it, it, this is an interesting question, isn't it, about how technology has affected relationships? It's really interesting. And, I mean, I'm actually, I think I must be one of the only people my age who's never been on a dating app because I met my husband when I was 19, just before they came in. Um, but I'm going to five weddings this year. Four of them met on dating apps. And I, I actually think that they've had almost no impact on relationships. It sort of feels like all the relationships which I'm seeing now come out of dating apps feels like they sort of would have happened anyway, which I suppose means that people, are, there's just a sort of bigger pool and people are meeting the people they were supposed to meet maybe a bit later and maybe that the meetings aren't quite as romantic as they used to be it's quite difficult my husband was a best man for his friend who who met uh, his wife on a dating app quite hard to tell a funny cute story about that so the sort of meeting <laughs> stories are a bit different but people seem to be finding the right people for them and it seems to be working rather well and i also think that there's this sort of myth that, that everyone's just sort of meeting up for you know very quick relationships on dating apps. I don't think it's true at all. As far as I can see, everyone I know seems to be quite seriously looking for love and it's quite sweet and working out pretty well. I mean, let's move it away from dating apps, but just technology in general, is it having an effect? I mean, I was at home the other night with my partner and I was on my laptop, he was on his laptop and we had a friend over and the friend said, just look at the two of you. Do you not ever talk to each other? Just sit there on <laughs> your laptop. Why are you talking to your friend? <laughs> That's a good That's point. <laughs> um, Daniel... <laughs> Well, just back on dating apps, I mean, there are some countries and cultures which have a long tradition of marriage brokers, and you actually, somebody organises the marriage, introduces people, the arranges for the families to meet, and then they decide whether this is the right match, and so on. That's a very fine tradition, and we just seem to have forgotten it. I'm sure we had it once, probably a thousand years ago. Read Jane Austen, of and course. Read did. Jane Austen, and uh, exactly, not even a thousand years ago. Words I never thought would ago. come out of the... the and, 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 and we've sort of uh, overlapped that and gone technology. And do it, it do it yourself now, but um, so I don't think it's uh, it's that remarkable. I mean, technology is a way of doing things. It isn't a thing in itself. It changes the way in which you do something. And I rather agree with um, um, Olivia that it's not actually okay. as dramatic as all that. Barry, look, uh, I do think it's changed the way in which we think about relationships. Um, technology does change things as well and you know you only need to look at medical technology and and think of what's happened over the past 50 or 60 years in terms of of contraception and the way in which that has affected uh dating i, I mean i uh, you know i found it really weird that people talked about um they talked about engaging in sex before they decided they were boyfriends and girlfriends, um, you know, or boyfriends and boyfriends or girlfriends and girlfriends. Um, but clearly, medical advance has made that much more common. Um, and it's now, I, I gather, you know, that that's the way people behave. So I'm taking it you're not on Tinder. 
You, you're probably right there. I, uh, you know, I struggled actually to find out what Tinder was a few years ago. Somebody, somebody, people kept saying it. And I said, "What is this thing?" Um, you know, and, and I realised it wasn't the thing that you made a campfire with. But no. um, okay, Polly. I think in important ways, nothing changes the human heart or what people are looking for, either good or bad. You know, people behave badly, not in social media, and they can behave very badly in social media too. I think sending short, sharp text messages, affectionate messages, emojis, it's a, I think, rather a nice way of communicating affectionate messages. Um, so I'm not too worried, but I think that, you know, there are problems about well, young people sexting and revenge porn and all of that. But pretty horrible things can happen I'm offline as well. I'm just contemplating the emoji I should use on the text when I, invi when I invite you for our date at the London ah. Stadium. <laughs> um, Zoe in Manchester says, should the Beijing Winter Olympics be taking place? Um, I don't know why I'm coming to you first, Barry Gardner. Um, the, the Olympics are supposed to be non-political. They're supposed to be when uh, the world forgets the political differences that we have and uh, at that stage we, we all engage in, in a sporting contest. Um, over the years, that's never quite been the case. Um, and so I don't really think that we should expect it to be this, the case in this situation. Um, there are huge problems with human rights in China uh, and I think it's absolutely right that many people will say no, it, it, it shouldn't be taking place. I, it used to be that sport was, was a way of people engaging with each other, sharing with each other um, that, that could leave that behind. I don't think it okay. is anything. Um, short answers if we can. Olivia. Uh, no, I don't really think it should be going ahead. I don't think we should be turning a blind eye to the hideous human rights abuses in China. Um, yeah, so I basically agree with what Barry says there. Um, Polly? Nope, I don't think so. And I think it's time to end the Olympics anyway. It's become outrageously <gasps> expensive and ludicrous. A much scaled down thing that should be scattered around the world. Is there any sport that you like? Oh, yes, I quite like individual sports. But the idea of everybody collecting together in one place in these fantastically expensive junkets, I think it's the wrong way. Did you not think it. the London Olympics was, was a great success, though? Yes. It was well, I, I think that was wonderful. Ceremony. It was wonderful. But nevertheless, we were talking before. There is a stadium that's costing, you know, vast sums of money that West Ham are not paying. Oh, wait till you what see it. You're going to be converted. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's I'm who's paying I'm, for I am it? going to take. I know you think I'm joking, <laughs> but I am going to ask you to a match, Daniel. I just think on China, it's important to distinguish between China as a country and a people on the one hand, mm. and what the current president, President Xi, has done um, in concentrating and turning into a dictatorship with very aggressive. Um, industrial, military, commercial uh, policies externally and a total crackdown on liberty. Not, I and mean, of course, there's egregious examples like Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, but even to the ordinary person in the street now, going out without your mobile phone so you can be tracked, just not having your mobile phone makes you a suspicious person to the police. Mm. Um, this is a, a, a very dangerous society that's being developed. It's well, bad for the Chinese. Sadly, we've run out of time for our normal fun text at the end. It was going to be about Wagatha Christie, but um, we'll have to... Maybe we'll do that tomorrow night. Barry, Barry, oh, my producer says, oh, squeeze it in. OK, all right, I will. The Wagatha Christie story is back in the news. Have you ever heard a better detective story? And if so, what is it? Are you all familiar with Wagatha Christie? No. no. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's to do with Colleen Rooney and Rebecca Vardy. There's a oh, court case God, going man. on about who, I mean, let's not even go into it, but favourite detective story, Barry Gardner. Good Lord. Sherlock Holmes? Sher <laughs> How unoriginal. Polly. I'd better stick with Miss Marple, hadn't I, at my age? Daniel. <laughs> oh, the best detective novel ever written, Raymond Chandler, The Big Sleep. Olivia. Um, I. I like the new, the new Sherlock Holmes ones by Anthony Horowitz. Very good. I've just well, finished them, actually. There you go. I'm <laughs> so glad we did that final question. Um, Barry Gardner, Olivia Ratley, Polly Toynbee, future West Ham supporting Polly Toynbee, and Daniel Moylan, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Cross Question this evening. Coming up in a moment, we're going to return to the subject of the day. Kurt Zuma being fined £250,000, two weeks' wages by West Ham. Should that be the end of it? 0345 6060 973. It's two minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and 
Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock. Detectives investigating lockdown parties at Downing Street say they'll start contacting staff by the end of the week. The Metropolitan Police says questionnaires will be sent to more than 50 people.